Over the last two weeks, we've been talking about pray first, then vote. Pray first. Does it make a difference? And we have shared last week how important it is Kansas be heard. What is a... <laughs> what in the world is that is what I'm asking. <laughs> okay. A squirrel or something. All right. Here you go. You know, they teach you in public speaking is to never let distractions cause folks in the place. So I'm going to ask you guys to focus. There you go. Is that better? All right. There you go. I hate this microphone, by the way. All right. As I was saying before, I think, that it's so important to pray before we vote. And our voice in the state of Kansas, how important is our voice? And can our voice be heard? And as we talked about last week, the most important thing that we can do is to ask God to allow our hearts and his voice to be communicated. So whatever we feel, however we vote, what we really need to do is to make sure that what we do is lined up with the candidate that best represents us. And last week we had Mr. Pompeo, and this week we have Mr. T. Hart. And we're going to ask questions so you can hear their hearts. Some of them are maybe a personal question, and some would be a national question and a local question, but these questions were brought up by people from the church that has given to me these questions to ask these candidates. So Todd and Vicki T. Hart are our guests today, and I'm going to ask Mr. T. Hart if he would make his way up to the platform. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Mr. T. Hart, if you could uh, say that none of us have met you before, what kind of a greeting would you like to share with Glenville Church? Well, uh... My microphone's on. I'm surprised. <laughs> I thought that was Cecil. This is Todd Tryharder here. <laughs> uh, good morning, and, and I'm glad that you're in church exercising your faith. I think that uh, our country would be stronger and better if more people would exercise their faith, not only on Sunday, but through the rest of the week. So I'm very pleased that you're here, and, and I'm very pleased to have this opportunity. In fact, I'm humbled to have this opportunity to talk to you this morning. Okay. Um, the first question that was asked, could you describe your, your faith experience? When did you get to know Christ, and are you a follower of Jesus? Um, I grew up in a Christian home. We went to church three times a week, Pastor, and probably like a lot of others, but it really didn't connect with me that I had to, be, that I had to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when I was uh, still in, in uh, high school, we had a, an evangelist come around, and uh, he, he said, are you a Christian? And I said, well, yes. And he said, well, how do you know? I said, because I go to church. And he said something that you've probably heard before, but he said, well, when you're standing in a garage, does that mean you're a car? And I said, well, no. He says, well, when you're standing in church, that doesn't make you a Christian. And it still didn't really connect with me that time, but over the years, I, I finally came to, in fact, it was a Jack Van Impey crusade in Sioux City, Iowa, when uh, I um, came forward to make a, made a public stand. Awesome. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, it's... <laughs> Still close to my emotions. Then I went to college at uh, Evangel after I transferred in. I studied engineering, electrical engineering in the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. And I transferred into Evangel, and on my first or second night there, I saw this beautiful woman across the, the crowd. We had an orientation for the first new students, transfer and freshmen. And I saw this uh, young girl who I found out later was from Kansas. And now my wife of 38 years, Vicki Holland T. Hart, is here. Uh, she grew up in Pratt. Um, but uh, in, while I was in um, Evangel, it, I, I became more aware of what it means to be a Christian and how to walk by faith. Uh, it was as if I was challenging my own Christianity. And then we got married. I went to work, uh, came to Boeing, worked at Boeing for 14 years. And during my time at Boeing, I realized that church in a, in a Christian faith, a walk, is not just going to church on Sunday. 
it's living your faith elsewhere, uh, in the workplace, in the store. I mean, you live your faith. And uh, there was a saying that came out, I think it was St. Francis Assisi, Assisi, and I will paraphrase. It said, when all else fails, use words. Talking about the Christian experience. And I thought about that, <clears throat> am I living my Christian faith? And uh, our uh, stepping into public life was a result of us believing that that's what God wanted us to do. Jeremiah 1.5 says that he knew us while we were yet in our mother's womb, before we were even created, actually. But, and I'm paraphrasing again. Mm. <laughs> but God has a plan for all of us, and for us, we felt like it was being in public life. That was how we would exercise our faith, walk the Christian walk. So uh, once again, we're stepping out in faith and um, uh, believing that this is what God wants us to do. Awesome. Good. One of the questions that was brought up is a national question that we watch the news on a daily basis, and we see the border issue. As a uh, congressman representing the state of Kansas, how would you handle the border crisis down in Texas and Arizona? Well, today we have what I think is a self-made crisis. We uh, have failed to um, protect the borders. Uh, it's a result of what we started um, while I was still in Congress. We authorized and appropriated funding for a barrier between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. Um, our current president canceled all those contracts before the, the job was done. So we now have this crisis. To me, the most compassionate thing we can do is return the children there to their parents in their country of origin. And when I hear the buses are running north, either to Oklahoma or Idaho or Chicago or anywhere else, I'm thinking they're going the wrong direction. We need to reunite them with their parents. It's unfair to keep them here as, as orphans. Uh, but the long-term solution has to be to complete the, the barrier uh, so that we can control our own borders. That's our it's how you establish a country. How do you know where the country is? It's by the borders. And we haven't done a very good job of establishing ourselves. But the first thing we should be doing is taking care of these kids that are here, making sure they have food and clothing, but then get them back reunited with their parents. Okay. Um, another national issue is Israel and uh, their right to exist as a state and their right to protect themselves. And uh, we hear all kinds of different things about Israel and Palestine and Gaza. What is your position on Israel and whether they should be a state, whether they should be able to protect themselves, and the issue that's taking place in the Middle East right now? How should we be on their side, or should we be on their side? I think we should be firmly on their side, and I would do everything within my power as a member of Congress to support them with our intelligence, with supplies, with, what, with international support as well. I think we should speak in favor of them. It, it, can you imagine this? If we were living here in Wichita and Oklahoma was lobbing rockets into our town, we wouldn't tolerate that. If our kids were being killed, if our schools were in jeopardy, uh, Israel has a right to defend itself. And they have a right to remove those rockets. What I think should happen there is that they should clean out the, the Gaza Strip and, and one of two things should happen. Either they should stay there and make sure that no rockets are fired from there, or that the international community comes in with troops to make sure that no more rockets come in so that Israel is no longer under attack. If you look at, at the way, I mean, we are a, a country based on Judeo-Christian values. Uh, our connections are with Israel, spiritually, socially. Uh, our, we have Jews that live here in America, and so we are connected in many ways with trade, with uh, uh, they are our, our, our only ally in the Middle East that's a democracy, and they have stood with us for us to ever abandon them or question what they're doing to protect their own families and children. To me, is wrong. We should stand firmly with them, and I would do that as a member of Congress. Do you feel that the United States of America are their allies now, or do you feel like that we have vacated our position with them? I think we have, we have vacated our position that we once had uh, when I
participants in healthcare. They have their own place. So um, while I was there, that was the idea that I had. Uh, after I left, this Congress has funded the administration of Obamacare, which is what you see in the ads. Uh, if you don't fund the administration, then Obamacare goes away. They can't write the checks. They can't send out the letters to cancel your insurance. They can't administer it, the website, everything else. So uh, to stop it in its tracks, you would defund it. And Heritage.org has explained this very well. What, if I have the chance to go back, uh, I know that this president will not allow it to be repealed. I mean, Congress has proved that by voting 57 times to repeal it and never goes anywhere. It's doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, expecting a different result. To me, just is a waste of time. What they should have been doing, what I would do if I return, is target things that would be a very good fight with the American public. Get something that's like what Ronald Reagan said, find an 80% issue and stand next to it. For me, we would start by taking the IRS agents out of Obamacare. They should not be harassing private citizens on whether they're getting tax credits for Obamacare or not. There's a mechanism in place for that. So I would start by the next funding bill saying, Mr. Obama, if you want Obamacare, you can have all of this except the IRS agents. Following that, I would go into regulatory reform. And the reason for that is Medicare was too cumbersome when it had 8,000 codes, codes for medical procedures. When a doctor or nurse did something, they had to put a code in for that medical service. Obamacare has increased those 8,000 codes to 100,000 codes. So we need regulatory reform, and that would be the second thing that I would do if I get the chance to go back. But Ob Obamacare cannot be repealed today because of this president, but it can be reformed. And that's what this Congress should have been doing instead of voting 57 times wastefully to try to overturn it. Okay. Uh, of course, we're from Kansas, and so we do care about the Kansas economy. And uh, we believe that uh, w when you served in the past, you did a wonderful job helping uh, keep the tanker here in Wichita. What would you do if you were reelected into Congress to help stimulate the Kansas economy? Well, uh, thank you for recognizing that we did fight hard to make sure that those uh, air refueling tankers were American jobs made by American workers at an American factory. Uh, locally, we've lost half our airplane companies. Boeing is gone. Beechcraft is now bankrupt. Uh, what I would do differently uh, is I would stop outsourcing our national security jobs. Today, there are 1,500 jobs in Brazil sent there by our Pentagon. Now, when our Pentagon wanted to send a $60 billion contract to the French, I fought very hard. I reached across the aisle to, take, to get Democrat allies. I pestered our president at that time, George, Bruce, George Bush, so much that every time he saw me, he called me Tanker Todd, because I was always talking about the air refueling tankers. Uh, we can strengthen our local economy by bringing those 1,500 jobs back from Brazil, and that's what I would fight to do. Maybe too far gone, but it's, we got to have that fight. We should not outsource our national security jobs, because our troops deserve American products made by American workers at an American company. Uh, whether it's Textron Aviation or Beechcraft, uh, it should have been Beechcraft, but it, it just wasn't. And I, I don't know why our, our congressman didn't fight to do that, because I would have. Uh, the other two things are not as, as emotional for me, but they are just as important. The first one would be bonus depreciation. Following September 11, 2001, we lost 25,000 um, aircraft jobs here in Wichita. I went to the Ways and Means Committee chairman, Bill Thomas, and asked him to put in bonus depreciation for aircraft sales. When we did that, we dramatically increased sales and, and jobs followed. I had a Cessna salesman tell me that the first six days after that became law, he sold more jets than he did the previous six months. It has a dramatic impact. The third thing would be a Section 179 depreciation, which allows employers to invest in new jobs and get to write off the total expense of that investment the first year. Those three things would turn around our aircraft community. In our agricultural community, I would defund the EPA's regulations to regulate water on farms. Uh, the EPA wants to regulate every little puddle, every stock pond, every stock tank. They want to tell farmers when they can fertilize, when they can plant, when they can do, use pesticides, when they can use herbicides. That's not the place of the federal government. Those are family farms and they need some relief. So those are the things that I would do immediately to try to get our local economy back on track. Yeah. Um, in the past, you served in the, in the Congress for 17 years? 16. 16 yeah. years. Um, when you're looking at term limits, are you supportive of term limits? Or um, like we have one of our uh, senators that's been in for 47 years. Mm -hmm. uh, is this something that you desire to be a lifetime 
politician, or is this something that you feel like is an is a issue right now at hand that you have to seize to fix? Well, it's an issue right now. That I feel like Washington is a train wreck, and nobody's trying to get the cars back up on the track and down the rail, so it's an immediate thing. But uh, as far as term limits, uh, when I ran on, uh, in 1994, it was the contract with America that we were talking about. And in there, one of the things that we promised we would vote on was term limits. And I voted for 12 years for Congress and 12 years for the Senate. I never made any personal commitment uh, to, on, on term limits because I thought the voters would take care of me if I ever failed the job. Mm -hmm. uh, but I started to look around. You know, we have these 50 state laboratories that do similar things. California has Im imposed term limits. They have six years for the House and eight years for the state. These are state House and state Senate. Um, what we're seeing happen in California is, is, is the government unions or the bureaucracy is now taking over the government. Uh, Joe Baca is a congressman from the Los Angeles area, and he told me that when he was a state representative in California, he would have to go into a conference room, and on one side was the government unions, like the EFL-CIO, SEIU, and, I'm, and I don't want to debate the, the necessity of unions. They have their place in America. But in, this, in California, they had to give the approval before the Democrat leadership would even schedule a committee meeting on Mr. Baca's uh, legislation. So we have unelected people in the bureaucracy that are now running California, and because of that, they have a, a $60 billion deficit. They have, you know, a, there's just a lot of challenges there that I think are driven by the bureaucracy rather than the elected officials. If we did that in America, keep in mind we have 3 million people working for the federal government. They are not elected, and today they treat the people in Congress like temporary help. They are not responsive. They do not do anything that, uh, unless they are forced to do it by funding. In our Constitution, Section 1, or Article 1, Section 7, it says that all revenue bills start in the House of Representatives. That gives the House of Representatives unique characteristics to pull the, the purse strings tight and stop the funding. And that's the only control, after they pass legislation, that's the only control they have to make sure the administration and the bureaucracy does their job. Today, our Congress is just giving them a blank check. Uh, that's why you know, pulling back some of these fundings is very important. So if we give a bureaucracy more power and have less experienced people in Washington, D.C., my concern is, would be that the government unions have more of a sway over our economy and the way we live our lives today. If you look at, for example, Department of Homeland Security, they think people that go to church are terrorists. They have released memos that say, if you own a firearm, if you're pro-life, if you're a veteran, you're at risk of being a terrorist. Uh, we already know that the IRS is trying to uh, impose what ministers can say from the pulpit. To me, that's a violation of the First Amendment. If we give the bureaucracy more and more authority and don't send courageous people up there who will fight them, then we're going to end up with a very large, intrusive federal government that takes away the constitutional rights that we have. Like NSA listening to our phone calls. General Clapper, the head of all intelligence for the federal government, said, yes, we are listening to your phone calls. Somebody has to stand up against them and say, you're not getting any money to listen to phone calls unless you have a warrant, which is the way it used to be under President Bush. Under President Obama, they've expanded it. The bureaucracy has gotten too powerful. And our Congress now, with the inexperience they have, are not pulling back the purse strings and protecting our constitutional rights. The First Amendment, so ministers can speak what they want to speak. The, second, or the Fourth Amendment, so that we can um, speak freely on our telephones without the federal government capturing our private data or on, be on Facebook or text messages or emails. So there's, and the Tenth Amendment, you know, so that our states have the rights we have to have strong individuals who will fight for these rights. Uh, we don't have that today in my mind, and that's why we're seeing this Congress fully fund this, con this president who has allowed the NSA to listen to our phone calls, allowed the IRS to attack churches and private uh, organizations, 501c3s, Tea Party groups, for example, allowed our congressmen to put in legislation that prohibits states' rights to label genetically modified organisms, GMOs. I mean, that is not protecting the Bill of Rights or our Constitution. I swore a long time ago to uphold and protect the Constitution. Once you make that oath, it doesn't go away. And one of the reasons I'm running again is to stand firm against, uh, once again, for the Constitution, against the big government and the bureaucracy running over our personal rights. That's why I, I have, have not uh, taken a, an oath. The voters will tell me when I'm not doing my job. And I hope that uh, this time that we will tell our current congressman, because this is what I believe, uh, that he has not done his job to protect our Constitution. Okay, if you have an audience here that uh, many of them have never met you, uh, why would you ask them to vote for you? 
Well, besides my lovely wife, Vicki, <laughs> uh, the reason I think that you, um, that I would ask you to vote for me is because I'm a constitutional conservative. I'm a man of faith. Uh, I believe in listening to people. I would, uh, in, when I was in office, I had multiple town hall meetings. Uh, I would take your ideas because to me, what's happening in Main Street, Kansas, is much more important than what's happening in, in Washington, D.C. or on Wall Street. Today, Washington, D.C. has become all about the money. And you're seeing it play out on the television today, ad after ad after ad after ad. You've seen it where uh, the Americans for Prosperity, which is funded by um, Coke Industries, uh, they're running ad after ad after ad. Why? Because it's become all about the money in Washington, D.C. Um, I started with zero dollars. My opponent started with $2.3 million. He's raised another million, so it's like $3 million. And we add on what Coke has done. I'm being outspent 30 to 1. But I believe in listening to the people and returning this seat back to public service. So that's why I would ask you to vote for me. Don't vote for somebody who's swayed by big money. Because if it becomes all about the money in Washington, D.C., then it's not about us. It's about the lobbyists. You won't be listened to unless you're a lobbyist. And that's too much of what I see today. So I'm asking you to bring this seat back to the people, to public service, and ignore the power of the office or the perks of Washington or the privileges of running around having destination fundraisers with lobbyists, which is like having lobbyists pay for your holidays. That's what's happening in Washington today. For me, it's always been about the people and the grassroots. And so I would ask you to support me to, number one, bring this seat back to the people, make it about public service. Number two, to Im implement my plans to bring our local economy back on track so that we don't outsource our national security jobs anymore. Number three, I didn't get a chance to talk about this much, but to remove the barriers that the federal government is creating in our economy today. Our economy shrunk 2.9% the first quarter of this year. If we want to get our local economy back on track, we've got to pull back the reins of gov the federal government because they are the barriers of creating a stronger national economy too. So those are the three reasons I would ask for you to uh, vote for me on August 5th. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. If you have your Bibles, if you would, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be talking about the importance of prayer. And when we talk about prayer, what prayer does, especially even in a political arena, how important is prayer and what is our mandate with prayer. We talked a little bit last week about how important it is to pray for those that are rule over you, whether you voted for them or whether you even agree with them. The only way that changed minds will take place is if people of God ask God to move within the hearts of people in authority. So when the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, therefore I exhort first of all that supplications prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made of all men for kings and all those in authority that they may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved to come to the knowledge of the truth. I think one of the first points that we have to talk about, we need to pray. We need to pray for the issues of of America, and we need to pray for the leaders of America. We need to evaluate what God wants for us individually, whether it's locally or whether it's globally. We need to ask God to change the heart of individuals. We need to look at what is important to God. You know, when we talk about freedom, there's a difference between the freedom of religion and the freedom from religion. We do need to have the freedom of religion, to be able to worship our God, to be able to sing our songs, to be able to honor God in our lifestyle in whatever way we want to. But we do not want to have the freedom from religion. It is not about from religion. Our country was built upon Christian character, Christian conduct. It was the reason why we even established the United States of America, is to be able to pursue our faith in Jesus. Not in religion. 
It was established about Christianity. And so often we lose the sight of the fact that Christianity, Jesus Christ, was the reason why our country was even established. We can look at all kinds of quotes from all kinds of individuals about the importance of our freedom and what it takes to stand for, firm for Jesus Christ. The Declaration of Independence was written, and, and uh, Ben Franklin got up and said this, Gentlemen, if it is true that no one single petal from a flower falls to the ground without escaping God's attention, will the distress of this nation go unheeded? Let us therefore determine to seek his faith. And after he said that, 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence went to their knees and began to pray to seek God's wisdom. They understood. These 56 men knew that they are seeking God's direction. It's not about the popularity of the day. It's what does God want. And when they signed that Declaration of Independence, they knew that was a death warrant for them. They knew that everything was going to change. They knew it was not about their popularity. It was a bigger cause. And that cause was freedom. 56 brave men. Five were captured and tortured by British before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned to the ground. Two lost their sons in the American Revolution. Nine fought and died with wounds from the Revolutionary War. Carter Braxton, a wealthy Virginia trader, saw his ship destroyed and had to sell his home to pay his debts, and he died in poverty. Thomas McLean had to, had to constantly move his family because of the British harassment. He served in Congress without pay and died in poverty. See, it wasn't about their names. It was about a commitment. It was about a commitment that I believe we have lost sight of. I believe sometimes in our country and in our churches, we lick our finger and stick our finger in the air to find out which way the wind is blowing. And we find out the popularity of the day and we want everybody to be on our side so we go to that position. Where I believe the popularity of the day shouldn't make any difference. I believe what we should do is we should open up God's word and fall on our face before God and say, God, how would you want me to move? What do you want me to do? The Declaration of Independence was not signed because of popularity. Our country was not founded because of popularity. It was founded upon a commitment of freedom, a commitment to follow after Christ. Our churches, our state, and our country need to fall on their face before God and say, what? What, Lord? Just like Ben Franklin said, pray, seek God's face. What do you have me to do? What should I say? We need to do what God wants us to do. George Washington, in his farewell address, says this, Do not let anyone claim tribute of America patriotism if they even attempt to remove religion from politics. Wow. Religion forms our government. It forms our opinion. If we take God out of every issue that we are in, what we have, we have a depraved country. But when we put God in every issue, have our congressmen, our Senate, and our Supreme Court pray and ask God's face, what should we do? Then we take a depraved country, put God's blessing on it, and then we can have a blessed country. That's what we need. There's no way our country can change, radically change for the cause of Christ if we as the church, if we as the believers, if we as the biggest volunteer people in our world, the church, if we don't get up and do something, if we don't ask God's hand, if we don't stand for what God stands for, if we wink at a country that winks at sin, if we wink at congressmen, Senate, and the Supreme Court that stand up for anything but God's word, where are we heading? We are heading to a path where God will resist the blessing upon a country. We must stand for what God stands for. We must bless and honor those that God blesses. And if we, the church, if we wink at if we look and say, you know what, somebody else will do it. Another organization will stand up. 
The next president will fix the issue. Well, every time we look and we try to pass the buck, it never works out. James chapter 5, verse 16, it says this, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It works. It changes the heart of God. When God sees his people on their knees imploring God's word and God's will upon people's lives, then and only then can God move to the hearts of individuals and change the direction and do something drastic because the people of God are humbled and they are broken because a country of people have left God out. We can't leave God out. And if we leave God out of our country, we'll leave him out of our homes, we'll leave him out of our churches, and we will have no direction. We will do whatever we think is right in our own eyes and we'll flounder around and we will drown because we have no direction. But God does give us direction. He gives us direction. It's found in verses 2 and 3 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says, The kings of all who are in authority... We need to pray for everyone in authority over us that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. We must live in godliness and in reverence. We should respect those in authority over us, but we should never let them rule over us. We should always allow God to take the top stand. We should always pray, what does God want for us. I want to pray for them. I want to honor them. I want to lift them up. But my first and most prized possession to honor has to be God. I must always honor God. In Isaiah chapter 33 verse 22, listen to this. It says, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver and the Lord is our king. He will save us. Do you see the three branches of government? Do you see the judge? That is the judicial branch. The lawgiver is our legislative branch. And the king is our executive branch. The three branches of our government was established through Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. God cares. God looks at what we do. We honor him. We God, we trust. Under God's name will we survive. We must always live righteously, reverently godliness and that's our standard in which god wants us to have we need to pray for those over us we as a church we as individuals we must live our life pleasing to him and then i believe one of the most important things that we must do we must share christ we should never lose the evangelism of our spirit when we gave our life to christ and the power that god has given to us that fervency within our life we should never lose sight of God's calling upon our life. We should never lose sight that God forgave us. He cleaned us up. He forgave us of our sins. What Jeremy sang up there, the old rugged cross, he was hanging, and the sins upon this world were upon his shoulders. We can look at that, and it should send chills up our spine because once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was blind, but now I can see. It is not about me. I have nothing in me that's any good. It's all about Christ. It's all about what he has done for me. And we as a church, we must never forget the only reason we are here is because of what Christ has done. The only power that we have is because of the power of Jesus. The only voice that we have is because of him. And he has told us to pray. He's told us to get out, get involved in our community, make an impact, share the love and the forgiveness of Christ. If the church is dead, our country is dead. If the homes are dead, our country is dead. If we're taking a back seat in any position, whether it's raising our kids, in the church, in the school, or in the government, if we're taking a back seat and we say it is not important, what we're saying is, God, count me out. I don't need this. I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to participate. Let somebody else handle it. And all we're doing is kicking the can down the road 
Maybe somebody else will do it. Maybe somebody else will take care of it. And then we're going to wake up 10 to 15 years from now, and the privileges that we once had, the freedoms that we once held on to, are way down the street to a point that we can't even grasp it. It is so far gone, we can't even communicate about it. What we must do is we must hold, and we must stand, and we must fight, and we must never be embarrassed that we represent Jesus Christ in a lost and dying world. And the Bible tells us that we are a light in a dark world. So don't be surprised that because you have faith, because you're a man or a woman of God, and you stand up and say, I will not allow that to take place. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the principles of the word of God. And somebody stands up and opposes you. Oh, oh, what do I do? What do I do? You proclaim the name of Christ. You're a light in a dark world. It is a crooked and perverse world. They are going to rebel against you. They are going to stand up against you. But you have the greatest power on your side, the power of God. And if we stand up and not be ashamed that Jesus Christ is Lord, what he will do is he will elevate up on his shoulders and he will give us the power and the authority and the voice to be heard because we're not ashamed of who we are talking about. We're not talking about you. We're not talking about me. We're talking about Jesus. The greatest name ever named. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. We can never forget that the most important change in this world is the change that you received when you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. You were adopted into a family. You have been cleansed from your sin. You have given an inheritance in heaven. You are forever changed. We can never forget that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine. Be a lighthouse in a dark world. Wherever you are, let them know that Jesus is real. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the fruit of the Spirit, the overflow within your life should be so radiant. You don't have to tell people what you do. You shouldn't have to tell people that you're a believer. You shouldn't have to say anything. They should be able to tell in your life, in your conduct, in your actions that you are a genuine follower of Christ. The decisions and the actions that you have and you perform are one that just breeds Christ, breathes Christ, exudes Christ in your actions and in your words. In Psalms chapter 33, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord's. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord's. When our nation includes those who call themselves Christians and we cease to look at God, we cease to be blessed by God. We, the church, in this political arena, we must use our vote. We must put people in office that represents you, that speaks for you, that has the same ideals as you, that understands the Christian values, that understands it is hard work. People may oppose you, but it's important because that's what Christ has asked us to do. We as the church, a little church in Wichita, Kansas, we have a voice. We can be heard. We can be heard because God cares. We can be heard because of our life represents Christ. We are not going to wink at sin. We're not going to take the back seat. We're going to stand up and say, Jesus Christ is the only hope for America. It's not another president. It's not the Congress. It's not the Supreme Court. The only hope we have is Jesus. The only way a country that's turned their back on Christ and Christian standards is if the church, Glenville, stands up and is heard. Not wink at it, not run from it, 
Not be ashamed of it, but stand up and say, my Lord, my God is Jesus, and I am not ashamed. Invite, communicate, prayer. God can change a city. God can change your family. God can change our country. But first of all, can God change you? And the only way that he can is if you ask him. He's not going to make you do anything. He's going to open up the door. He's going to ask you to invite him in. Because the scripture we just read, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. That will take place. Whether it takes place on your terms before you die, or it'll take place in God's terms after you die, when you stand before God and you see that God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead, standing at the throne, you will bow your knee. You will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. The problem is you're going to be judged by the judge instead of judged by the Savior. I want to be judged by the Savior. I want to be forgiven of my sins. And I want the name of Jesus to be proclaimed from my mouth, from my life, in my actions. That's our responsibility. To pray first, then to vote. Pray, then vote. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And we love you. And I pray that you will stir our hearts. You'll give us a passion. You'll give us direction. And you'll give us a sense that it is important. Our country, founded on Jesus, have been blessed by God. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to put your hand upon our country. Put your hand upon our church. Put your hand upon our men of leadership in our homes, our individuals. We need your blessing. We need your guidance. We ask you, Lord, to take us, help us, love us, and guide us. I pray that on August 5th, these two men, good men, that your hand will be upon them. And Lord, that your direction with these two men will be real. And the one that you have laid in front of us, that you'll give to us the discernment to vote for the one that you want us to have. And I pray even ask that your hand will be upon them in victory and in defeat. That just because the popularity of the people doesn't mean that they change their political stand. That you allow them, even if they win, to be humbled, to do what they say they would do, to give them the ability and the strength and the confidence to stand in a dark world, to love them and help them in every area of their life. We ask you for that. We thank you. Stir our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to ask our men to make their way uh, to the back to take up our Lord's offerings. And at the end of the service, what we try to do is we try to make sure that you have an opportunity to continue in worship. Worship in song. And didn't Abandoned Kansas do a good job today? Let's give them a round of applause. We also need to be praying for them. Uh, can you imagine all these guys traveling for 31 days, 28 shows in a van together? And I, I asked them last night in about four or five days, you guys will probably be ready to kill yourself or kill each other in, in the van. And uh, they, I just ask you to pray for them. They are, they are trying to be a testimony in, in, in a, you know, in a, in a in an area that's very difficult, in the area of music, to be able to worship the Lord in different venues, to stand out, and, and they do a wonderful job on their songs. I just ask God's blessing upon them and ask God to give them safe travels and to bring them back. And then we do have a, 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 an issue at the church that I'd like to share with you. We have a young lady. Her name is Ashley Jantz. Neil is our video guy that runs our video booth in the back. They were on vacation in Colorado Springs last week, and she went into labor. And she's only 25 weeks along. 
and her due date is not till November. And when they went to the doctor, now she is totally on bed rest in Colorado Springs, eight hours from her family. And uh, we just ask you to be praying for Ashley and Neil Jantz at this time, that they are trying to, um, to make her not have the baby for a few weeks. And, uh, and so she is in total bed rest. So they're, they're eight hours away from their family. So if you would just lift up Ashley and Neil Jantz, that would be very important for us to be doing that. I'm going to ask our men to make their way down here. We'll be taking up our Lord's tithes and our offerings. You know, when we say everything belongs to God, everything belongs to God. Our hearts, our lives, our resources, everything that we should do, everything we should have, we should honor God with. And we do that through our tithes and our offerings at the church. You can give it in many different ways. You can put it in the offering plate. We also have offering boxes at each one of the doors. You can go online and you could uh, give online. We just want to give you the opportunity for God to bless you by you honoring him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we come before you. We thank you for your love and your guidance. And Lord, we understand that you've given us the ability to work and you've blessed us with resources. And we know that we cannot have anything if it wasn't from you. So, Lord, we want to honor it back. We want to give you back our first fruits. We want to give you our love and our respect and our honor in our life, in our resources, in our families, and in our church. Allow us never to forget what you have done for us and allow us to bless you and honor your work and honor the church. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.